Chapter Two. Dally was waiting for Johnny and me under the street light at the corner of Pickett and Sutton. And since we got there early, we had time to go over the drugs to the drugstore in the shopping center and goof around. We bought Cokes and blew the straws at the waitress and walked around eyeing things that were lying out in the open until the manager got wise to us and suggested we leave. He was too late though. Dally walked out with two packages of cools under his jacket. Then we went across the street and down Sutton a little way to the Dingo. There are lots of drive-ins in town. The Sulks go to the, the way out and to Rusty's and the Greasers go to the Dingo and to Jay's. The Dingo is a pretty rough hangout. There's always a fight going on there and once a girl got shot. We walked around talking to all the Greasers and Hoods we knew. Leaning in car windows or hopping into the back seats and getting in on who was running away and who was in jail and who was going with who and who could whip who and who stole what and when and why. We knew about everybody there. There was a pretty good fight while we were there between a big 23 year old greaser and a Mexican hitchhiker. We left when the switchblades came out because the cops would be coming soon and nobody in his right mind wants to be around when the fuzz show. We crossed Sutton and cut around behind Spencer's special, the discount house, and chased two junior high kids across the field for a few minutes. By then it was dark enough to sneak in over the back fence of the nightly double drive-in movie. It was the biggest in town and showed two movies every night, and on weekends, four. You could say you were going to the nightly double and have time to go all over town. We all had the money to get in. It only costs a quarter if you're not in a car. But Dally hated to do things the legal way. He liked to show that he didn't care whether there was a law or not. He went around trying to break laws. We went to the rows of seats in front of the concession stand to sit down. Nobody else was there except two girls who were sitting down front. Dally eyed them coolly, then walked down the aisle and sat right behind them. I had a sick feeling that Dally was up to his usual tricks, and I was right. He started talking loud enough for the two girls to hear. He started out bad and got worse. Dallas could talk awful dirty if he wanted to, and I guess he wanted to then. I felt my ears get hot. Too bitter Steve, or even Soda, would have gone right along with him just to see if they could embarrass the girls. But that kind of kicks just doesn't appeal to me. I sat there, struck dumb, and Johnny left hastily to get a Coke. Okay, now as I pause right here, and you notice that Pony Boy is struck dumb. Now, we know that Pony Boy is not dumb, okay? Um, but something here has happened to cause him to feel um, not as smart as what he's capable of, of being. So he is struck dumb. Now, this is a signpost contrast and contradictions. So when you're reading and a character says or does something that's opposite, what he or she has been saying or doing all along, we have to stop and ask ourselves, why is the character doing that? Okay, so there's your signpost. So we stop and we ask ourselves, why is the character doing that? I wouldn't have felt so embarrassed if they had been greasy girls. I might even have helped old Dallas, but those two girls weren't our kind. They were tough looking girls, dressed sharp and really good looking. They looked about 16 or 17. One had short dark hair and the other had long red hair. The redhead was getting, was getting mad or scared. She sat up straight and she was chewing hard on her gum. The other one pretended not to hear Dally. Dally was getting impatient. He put his feet up on the back of the redhead's chair, winked at me and beat his own record for saying something dirty. She turned around and gave him a cool stare. Take your feet off my chair and shut your trap. Boy, she was good looking. I'd seen her before. She was a cheerleader at her school. I'd always thought she was stuck up. Dally merely looked at her and kept his feet where they were. Who's gonna make me? The other one turned around and watched us. That's the greaser that jockeys for the slash J sometimes, she said, as if we couldn't hear her. I have heard the same tone a million times. Greaser, greaser, greaser. Oh yeah, I had heard that tone before too many times. What are they doing at the drive-in without a car? I thought in Dallas said. I know you too. I've seen you around rodeos. It's a shame you can't ride bull half as good as you can talk it. The redhead said coolly and turned back around. That didn't bother Dally in the least. You two barrel race, huh? You better believe you'd better leave us alone, the redhead said in a bidding, biting voice, or I'll call the cops. Oh my, my, Dally looked bored. You've got me scared to death. 
You ought to see my record sometime, baby, he grinned slyly. Guess what I've been in for? Please leave us alone, she said. Why don't you be nice and leave us alone? Dally grinned roguishly. I'm never nice. Want a Coke? She was mad by then. I wouldn't drink it if I was starving in the desert. Get lost, Hood. Dally Sign post alert. And strolled off. The girl looked at me. I was half scared of her. I'm half scared of all nice girls, especially Sucks. Are you going to start in on us? I shook my head wide-eyed. No. Suddenly she smiled. Gosh, she was pretty. You don't look the type. What's your name? I wish she hadn't asked me that. I hate to tell people my name for the first time. Ponyboy Curtis. Then I waited for the, you're kidding, or that's your real name, or one of the other remarks I usually get. Ponyboy is my real name, and personally, I like it. The redhead just smiled. That's an original and lovely name. My dad was an original person, I said. I've got a brother named Soda Pop, and it says so on his birth certificate. My name's Sherry, but I'm called Cherry because of my hair, Cherry Valance. I know, I said. You're a cheerleader. We go to the same school. You don't look old enough to be going to high school, the dark-haired girl said. I'm not. I got put up a year in grade school. Cherry was looking at me. What's a nice, smart kid like you running around with trash like that for? I felt myself stiffen. I'm a Grace, same as Dally. He's my buddy. I'm sorry, pony boy, she said softly. Then she said briskly, your brother Soda Pop, does he work at the gasoline station? A DX, I think? Yeah. Man, your brother is one doll. I might have guessed you were brothers. You look alike. I grinned with pride. I don't think I look one bit like Soda, but it's not every day I hear Sucks telling me they think my brother is a doll. Didn't he used to ride in rodeos? Saddle bronc? Yeah. Dad made him quit after he tore a ligament, though. We still hang around rodeos a lot. I've seen you two barrel race. You're good. Thanks, Cherry said. And the other girl, who was named Marcia, said, How come you don't see your brother at school? Or how come we don't see your brother at school? He's not any older than 16 or 17, is he? I winced, in, I winced inside. I've told you, I can't stand it, that Soda dropped out. He's a dropout, I said roughly. Dropout? made me think of some poor, dumb-looking hoodlum wandering the streets, breaking out streetlights. It didn't fit my happy-go-lucky brother at all. It fitted Dally perfectly, but you could hardly say it about Soda. Johnny came back then and sat down beside me. He looked around for Dally, then managed a shy hi to the girls and tried to watch the movie. He was nervous, though. Johnny was always nervous around strangers. Cherry looked at him, sizing him up as she had me. Then she smiled softly, and I knew she had him sized up right. Dally came striding back with an armful of Cokes. He handed one to each of the girls and sat down beside Cherry. This might cool you off. She gave him an incredulous look, and then she threw her Coke in his face. That might cool you off, greaser. After you wash your mouth and learn to talk and act decent, I might cool off too. Dally wiped the Coke off his face with his sleeve and smiled dangerously. If I had been Cherry, I would have beat it out of there. I knew that smile. Fiery, huh? Well, that's the way I like him. He started to put his arm around her, but Johnny reached over and stopped him. Leave her alone, Dally. Huh? Dally was taken off guard. He stared at Johnny in disbelief. Johnny couldn't say boo to a goose. Johnny gulped and got a little pale, but he said, you heard me. Leave her alone. Dally scowled for a second. If it had been me or Two Bit or Soda or Steve or anyone but Johnny, Dally would have flattened him without a moment's hesitation. You just didn't tell Dally Winston what to do. One time in a dime store, a guy told him to move over at the candy counter. Dally had turned around and belted him so hard, it knocked a tooth loose. A complete stranger, too. But Johnny was the gang's pet, and Dally just couldn't hit him. He was Dally's pet, too. Dally got up and stalked off. His fists jammed in his pockets and a frown on his face. He didn't come back. Cherry sighed in relief. Thanks. He had me scared to death. Johnny managed an admiring grin. You sure didn't show it. Nobody talks to Dally like that. She smiled. From what I saw you do, Johnny's ears got red. I was still staring at him. It had taken more than a nerve for him to, stay, to say what he'd said to Dally. Johnny worshipped the ground Dallas walked on, and I had never heard Johnny talk back to anyone, much less his hero. Marcia grinned at us. 
She was a little smaller than Cherry. She was cute, but that Cherry Valance was a real looker. Y'all sit up here with us. You can protect us. Johnny and I looked at each other. He grinned suddenly, raising his eyebrows so that they disappeared under his bangs. Would we ever have something to tell the boys? His eyes said plainly. We had picked up two girls, and classy ones at that. Not any greasy broads for us, but real sucks. Soda would flip when I told him. Okay, I said nonchalantly. Might as well. I sat between them, and Johnny sat next to Cherry. How old are y'all? Marcia asked. Fourteen, I said. Sixteen, said Johnny. That's funny, Marcia said. I thought you were both. Sixteen? Cherry finished for her. I was grateful. Johnny looked fourteen, and he knew it, and it bugged him something awful. Johnny grinned. How come y'all ain't scared of us like you were Dally? Cherry sighed. You two are too sweet to scare anyone. First of all, you didn't join in Dallas's dirty talk, and you made him leave us alone. And when we asked you to sit up here with us, you didn't act like it was an invitation to make out for the night. Besides that, I've heard about Dallas Winston, and he looked as hard as nails and twice as tough, and you two don't look mean. Sure, I said tiredly. We're young and innocent. No, Cherry said slowly, looking at me carefully. Not innocent. You've seen too much to be innocent. Just not dirty. Dally's okay, Johnny said defensively. Sign post nodded. alert. You take up for your buddies no matter what they do. When you're a gang, you stick up for the members. If you don't stick up for them, stick together. Make like brothers. It isn't a gang anymore. It's a pack. A snarling, distrustful, bickering pack like the socks in their social clubs or the street gangs in New York or the wolves in the timber. He's tough, but he's a cool old guy. He'd leave you alone if he knew you, I said, and that was true. When Steve's cousin from Kansas came down, Dally was decent to her and watched his swearing. We all did around nice girls who were the cousinly type. I don't know how to explain it. We try to be nice to the girls we see once in a while, like cousins and the girls in class, but we still watch a nice girl go by on st the street corner and say all kinds of lousy stuff about her. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. Well, Marcia said with finality, I'm glad he doesn't know us. I kind of admire him, Cherry said softly. So only I heard, and then we settled down to watch the movie. Oh yeah, we found out why they were without a car. They'd come with their boyfriends, but walked out on them when they found out the boys had brought some booze along. The boys had gotten angry and left. I don't care if they did, Cherry sounded annoyed. It's not my idea of a good time to sit in a drive-in and watch people get drunk. You could tell by the way she said it that her idea of a good time was probably high class and probably expensive. They decided to stay and see the movie anyway. It was one of those beach party movies with no plot, no acting, but a lot of girls in bikinis and some swinging songs, so it was all right. We were all four sitting there in silence when suddenly a strong hand came down on Johnny's shoulder and another on mine, and a deep voice said, Okay, greasers, you've had it. I almost jumped out of my skin. It was like having someone leap out from behind a door and yell boo at you. I looked fearfully over my shoulder, and there was Tubit grinning like a chessy cat. Glory, Tubit, scare us to death. He was good at voice imitations, and it sounded for all the world like a snarling soap. Then I looked at Johnny. His eyes were shut, and he was as white as a ghost. His breath was coming in smothered gasps. Tubit knew better than to scare Johnny like that. I guess he'd forgotten. He's kind of scatterbrained. Johnny opened his eyes and said weakly, Hey, Tubit. Tubit messed up his hair. Sorry, kid, he said. I forgot. He climbed over the chair and plopped down beside Marcia. Who's this? Your great aunts? Great grandmothers, twice removed, Cherry said smoothly. I couldn't tell if Two Bit was drunk or not. It's kind of hard to tell with him. He acts boozed up sometimes, even when he's sober. He cocked one eyebrow up and the other down, which he always does when something puzzles him or bothers him, or when he feels like saying something smart. Shoot, you're 96 if you're a day. I'm a knight, Marcia said brightly. Two Bit stared at her admiringly. Brother, you're a sharp one. Where'd you two ever get to be picked up by a couple of greasy hoods like Pony and Johnny? We really picked them up, Marcia said. We're really Arabian slave traders, and we're thinking about shanghaiing them. They're worth ten camels apiece, at least. Five, Tubit disagreed. They don't talk Arabian, I don't think. Say something in Arabian, Johnny Cake. I'll cut it out, Johnny broke in. Dally was bothering them, and when he left, they wanted us to sit with them to protect them, against wise cracking greasers like you, probably. Tubit grinned, because Johnny didn't usually get sassy like that. We thought we were doing good if we could get him to talk at all. Incidentally, we don't mind being called greaser by another greaser.
kind of playful then. Hey, where is old Dally anyways? He went hunting some action, booze or dames or a fight. I hope he don't get jailed again. He just got out. He'll probably find the fight, Two-Bit stated cheerfully. That's why I came over. Mr. Timothy Shepard and co. are looking for whoever so kindly slashed their car's tires. And since Mr. Curly Shepard spotted Dallas doing it, well, does, da does Dally have a blade? Not that I know of, I said. I think he's got a piece of pipe, but he busted his blade this morning. Good. Tim will fight fair if Dally don't pull a blade on him. Dally shouldn't have any trouble. Cherry and Marsha were staring at us. You don't believe in playing rough or anything, do you? A fair fight isn't rough, Tubic said. Blades are rough. So are chains and haters, er, so are chains and heaters and pull sticks and rumbles. Skin fighting isn't rough. It blows off steam better than anything. There's nothing wrong with throwing a few punches. Socks are rough. They gang up on one or two, or they rumble each other with their social clubs. Us greasers usually stick together. But when we do fight among ourselves, it's a fair fight between two. And Dally deserves whatever he gets. Because slash tires ain't no joke when you've got to work to pay for them. He got spotted, too. And that was his fault. Our one rule, besides stick together, is don't get caught. He might get beat up. He might not. Either way, there's not going to be any blood feud between our outfit and Shepherd's. If we needed them tomorrow, they'd show. If Tim beats Dally head in, and then tomorrow asks us for help in a rumble, we'll show. Dally was getting kicks. He got caught. He pays up. No sweat. Yeah, boy, Cherry said sarcastically. Real simple. Sure, Marcia said, I'm concerned. If he gets killed or something, you just bury him. No sweat. You dig okay, baby? Tubit grinned and lit a cigarette. Anyone want a weed? I looked at Tubit admiringly. He sure put things into words good. Maybe he was still a junior at 18 and a half, and maybe his sideburns were too long, and maybe he did get boozed up too much, but he sure understood things. Cherry and Marcia shook their heads at his offering of cigarettes, but Johnny and I reached for one. Johnny's color was back and his breathing was regular, but his hand was shaking ever so slightly. A cigarette would steady it. Pony boy, will you come with me to get some popcorn? Cherry asked. I jumped up. Sure, y'all want some? I do, said Marcia. She was finishing the coke Dally had given her. I realized then that Marcia and Cherry weren't alike. Cherry had said she wouldn't drink Dally's coke if she was starving, and she meant it. It was the principle of the thing, but Marcia saw no reason to throw away a perfectly good free coke. Me too, said Tubit. He flipped me a 50 cent piece. Get Johnny some too. I'm buying, he added as Johnny started to reach into his jean po jeans pocket. We went to the concession stand and as usual, there was a line a mile long. So we had to wait. Quite a few kids turned to look at us. You didn't see a kid grease and a sucky cheerleader together often. Cherry didn't seem to notice. Your friend, the one with the sideburns, he's okay? He ain't dangerous like Dallas, if that's what you mean. He is okay. She smiled and her eyes showed that her mind was on something else. Johnny, he's been hurt bad some time, hasn't he? It was more of a statement than a question. Hurt and scared? It was the socks, I said nervously, because there were plenty of socks mi milling around, and some of them were giving me funny looks, as if I shouldn't be with Cherry or something. And I don't like to talk about it either. Johnny getting beat up, I mean. But I started in, talking a little faster than I usually do because I don't like to think about it either. It was almost four months ago. I'd walked down to the DX station to get a bottle of pop and to see Steve and Soda because they'll always buy me a couple of bottles and let me help work on the cars. I don't like to go on weekends because then there's usually a bunch of girls down there flirting with Soda. All kinds of girls. Sucks too. I don't care too much for girls yet. Soda says I'll grow out of it. He did. It was a warmish spring day with the sun shining bright but it was getting chilly and dark by the time we started for home. We were walking because we had left Steve's car at the station. At the corner of our block, there's a wide open field where we play football and hang out. And it's often a site for rumbles and fistfights. We were passing it, kicking rocks down the street and finishing our last bottle of Pepsi when Steve noticed something lying on the ground. He picked it up. It was Johnny's blue jeans jacket, the only jacket he had. Left, he had. Looks like Johnny forgot his jacket, Steve said, slinging it over his shoulder to take it by Johnny's house. Suddenly, he stopped and examined it more carefully. There was a stain the color of rust across the collar. He looked at the ground. There was some more stains on the grass. He looked up and across the field with, with a stricken expression on his face. I think we all heard the low moan and saw the dark motionless hump 
on the other side of the lot at the same time. Soda reached him first. Johnny was lying face down on the ground. Soda turned him over gently, and I nearly got sick. Someone had beaten him badly. We were used to seeing Johnny banged up. His father clobbered him around a lot, and although it made us madder than heck, we couldn't do anything about it. But those beatings had been nothing like this. Johnny's face was cut up and bruised and swollen, and there was a wide gash from his temple to his cheekbone. He would carry that scar all his life. His white t-shirt was splattered with blood. I just stood there, trembling with sudden cold. I thought he might be dead. Surely nobody could be beaten like that and live. Steve closed his eyes for a second and muffled a groan as he dropped on his knees beside Soda. Somehow the gang sensed what had happened. Two-Bit was suddenly there beside me, and for once his comical grin was gone and his dancing gray eyes were stormy. Derry had seen us from our porch and ran toward us, suddenly skidding to a halt. Dally was there too, swearing under his breath and turning away with the sick expression on his face. I wondered about it vaguely. Dally had seen people killed on the streets of New York's West Side. Why did he look sick now? Johnny, Soda lifted him up and held him against his shoulder. He gave the limp body a slight shake. Hey, Johnny Cake. Johnny didn't open his eyes, but there came a soft question. Soda? Yeah, it's me, Soda Pop said. Don't talk. You're going to be okay. There was a whole bunch of them. Johnny went on, swallowing, ignoring Soda's command. A blue Mustang, full. I got so scared. He tried to swear, but suddenly started crying, fighting to control himself then sobbing all the more because he couldn't. I had seen Johnny take a whipping with a two-by-four from his old man and never let out a whimper. That made it worse to see him break now. Soda just held him and pushed Johnny's hair back out of his eyes. It's okay, Johnny Cake. They're gone now. It's okay. Finally, between sobs, Johnny managed to gasp out his story. He had been hunting our football to practice He had been hunting our football to practice a few kicks when a blue Mustang had pulled up beside the lot. There were four sulks in it. They had caught him, and one of them had a lot of rings on his hand. That's what had cut Johnny up so badly. It wasn't just that they had beaten him half to death. He could take that. They had scared him. They had threatened him with everything under the sun. Johnny was high-strung anyway, a nervous wreck from getting belted every time he turned around and from hearing his parents fight all the time. Living in those conditions might have turned someone else rebellious and bitter, it was killing Johnny. He had never been a coward. He was a good man in a rumble. He stuck up for the gang and kept his mouth shut good around cops. But after the night of the beating, Johnny was jumpier than ever. I didn't think he'd ever get over it. Johnny never walked by himself after that. And Johnny, who was the most law-abiding of us, now carried in his back pocket a six-inch switchblade. He'd use it, too, if he ever got jumped again. They had scared him that much. He would kill the next person who jumped him. Nobody was ever going to beat him like that again. Not over his dead body. I'd nearly forgotten that Cherry was listening to me, but when I came back to reality and looked at her, I was startled to find her as white as a sheet. All socks aren't like that, she said. You have to believe me, pony boy. Not all of us are like that. Sure, I said. That's like saying all you greasers are like Dallas Winston. I'll bet he's jumped a few people. I digested that. It was true. Dally had jumped people. He had told us stories about muggings in New York that made their hair on the back of my neck, that made the hair in the back of my neck stand up. But not all of us were that bad. Cherry no longer looked sick, only sad. I'll bet you think the socks have made it. The rich kids, the West Side socks. I'll tell you something, pony boy, and it may come as a surprise. We have troubles you've never even heard of. You want to know something? She looked me straight in the eye. Things are rough all over. I believe you, I said. We better get back out with the popcorn or two will think I ran off with his money. We went back and watched the movie through again. Marsha and Two-Bit were hitting it off fine. Both had the same scatterbrained sense of humor. But Cherry and Johnny and I just sat there looking at the movie and not talking. I quit worrying about everything and thought about how nice it was to sit with a girl without having to listen to her swear or to beat her off with a club. I knew Johnny liked it too. He didn't talk to girls much. Once while Dallas was in reform school, Sylvia had started hanging out, hanging on to Johnny and sweet-talking him and Steve.
and Steve got hold of her and told her if she tried any of her tricks with Johnny, he'd personally beat the tar out of her. Then he gave Johnny a lecture on girls and how a sneaking little broad like Sylvia would get him into a lot of trouble. As a result, Johnny never spoke to girls much. But whether that was because he was scared of Steve or because he was shy, I couldn't tell. I got the same lecture from Tubit after we'd picked up a couple of girls downtown one day. I thought it was funny because girls are one subject even Derry thinks I use my head about. And it really had been funny because Tubit was half crocked when he gave me the lecture and he told me some stories that about made me want to crawl under the floor or something. But he had been talking about girls like Sylvia and the girls he and Dally and the rest picked up at drive-ins drive in downtown. He never said anything about sucky girls. So I figured it was all right to be sitting there with them, even if they did have their own troubles. I really couldn't see what sucks would have to sweat about. Good grades, good cars, good girls, Madras and Mustangs and Corvair Corvairs. Man, I thought, if I had worries like that, I consider myself lucky. I know better now. Signpost alert.